Jonathan Larson is someone we've known since he was a banker, and today he is uh, the Chief Innovation Officer of Ping An Group and Chairman and CEO of Ping An Global Voyager Fund. So you're the man who goes around the world uh, looking how to deploy Ping An's uh, enormous assets. Uh, Ping An is what, $300 billion? $1 trillion company. A one trillion. Trillion. <clears throat> and, the, and the fund is? Uh, the fund is a $1 billion fund. It's a, a corporate venture capital fund. So we have a lot of other venture capital activities that are commercial in nature and deploy client money, but this particular one deploys Ping An money. And what we're trying to do is look around the world at companies that have capabilities that could be either helpful to Ping An or complementary to Ping An. It could be a business that we're in. It could be a white space where we haven't thought through what the new model is. It could be a technology that we're working on and we just find somebody else that's further ahead. Um, so we have no illusion that we have any monopoly on innovation. There's a huge world out there and our job is to go and find those leading uh, elements of uh, sort of new thinking, uh, of innovations, of new uh, business models that can be helpful to Ping An, both in China and as we expand internationally um, in other markets as well. Okay, describe Ping An to me as it was, as it is, and what is as it is going to be. As it was, insurance, uh, as it is, a number of ecosystems that are boiling, that are in the hot pot, uh, and then as it is going to be. I, um, I've been at the company two years, and I, I left City after 18 years running their global retail bank, amongst other things, spending a lot of time in Asia, of course, which is when uh, you and I interacted uh, uh, last. Um, and um, the... I, you know, I knew who Ping An was. I knew it was a very successful, very well-run, and very large company centered around insurance, but you know, with a broader range of businesses. Until I met Peter Maher, and he was able to sort of articulate both the story in detail and the vision. You know, I, I, I came away from that with a very different understanding, and it was. Well, why was Peter Ma? Uh, I mean, don't stop. But uh, why was Peter Ma? you know, uh, cultivating a banker like you. I, I had left City. I was hoping to take a year off, actually. I, I've turned 50. It's that mythical sabbatical that you promise yourself, and in most cases never happens. So I, was trying to, I was trying to do that. Uh, and um, a mutual friend uh, who had uh, actually worked at Ping An and run Ping An Bank for quite a number of years, a gentleman called Richard Jackson, um, introduced me to P Peter Maher and saying to me, listen, if you want to work for another big financial institution, you know, why not um, speak to Peter Maher? So I said, I'd be delighted to speak to Peter Maher. And it was a very interesting combination and uh, conversation. And the, the short summary is that after that conversation, I was working for him a month later. So oh, yeah. it obviously had an effect. Oh, yeah. um, but I think the story is, is this, that, you know, Peter started this company from zero in 1988 in Shenzhen. And anyone that knows the history of China knows that Shenzhen was a radical different place at that time uh, and uh, so the, the company had very modest beginnings started out in the PNC insurance business uh, became a life insurance company uh, Peter always had this idea that firstly there was this opportunity to build a range of services around the consumer and be a, a, a single provider across many different need groups uh, many have tried that strategy of course many have failed I think Pian is one of the success stories in the world uh, in pursuing that vision. Secondly, uh, he had the view that in a government-dominated economy, license optionality is very important. And so to this day, Ping An has the widest range of financial licenses um, of any company in China. Uh, and if you look at a business like asset management, um, it's, it's a good illustration of why that's important. So we, we manage a lot of third-party assets and a lot of our own assets. So in the aggregate, it's, you know, 1.3, 1.4 trillion dollars, something like that, um, and the ex excluding the bank balance sheet, uh, and the um, which is about 500 billion dollars. But we use many different vehicles to do that. You can't simply aggregate all of the assets from life insurance, PNC, from trust, from uh, the asset management subsidiary, and put them into one vehicle and and manage it. The, the licensing system simply doesn't work that way. So having that optionality is quite important. So that was the foundation. Uh, the company grew very well. Um, you know, Peter is a natural entrepreneur uh, and a natural business person. If he was a true blue insurance man, he would have created, he would have built on the insurance um, asset, uh, the insurance balance sheet, right? 
Uh, here what is done is grown on the, the, the data balance sheet, uh, more than the insurance balance sheet, or so it seemed. Yeah. Um, and he was adding up the assets and he was adding up the, uh, the, the group structure, right? And, and you had the bank in there. And for a long time, he didn't know what to do with it. Uh, the, the bank was smaller than, you know, the, the smallest thing. It's now a big business. It's competing against these big state-owned companies, and to this day, Ping An is the only large-scale, non-state-owned, non-state-controlled uh, financial institution. In about 2000, the company decided to integrate all of its databases to look at the customer as a single entity across all the different platforms, uh, to introduce NPS as a fundamental metric. So they were the first company in China to do that. We still use that as a fundamental metric. Uh, and to introduce cross-selling or relationship depth KPIs. So that was a very important stage. And it's an early in instance of thinking about the data what assets. What are the numbers now? What, what's uh, cross-sell uh, now? Like, what does it look like? What, what are the goals like? We have about 180, um, just under 200 million financial customers. Uh, we have about half a billion uh, digital users across all of our ecosystems. About a third of our new customers in the financial business come from the digital ecosystem. Um, you know, in some way, you know, probably 90% uh, of customers come from some kind of digital connection for the company. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, uh, our agents sell about 30 different products. Um, and uh, uh, so cross-selling is a fundamental driver of their, um, of their, um, uh, sort of agenda and incentives. Uh, what is Pingan today? Uh, you know, um, how would you best describe so it? I, I would, I would position it and explain it as a um, very large financial institution that has embraced technology very deeply, um, that um, has uh, begun to build a very significant uh, health ecosystem, starting from its insurance and health insurance business, but you know, uh, bridging into. Um, uh, telemedicine and uh, using uh, health data to try and create value both for the state health system uh, and for the private sector, um, and who has found that it is able to create new businesses in many different areas of finance. Uh, OneConnect, uh, Lufax would be very good examples. Um, and beyond that has found that the capabilities it has acquired in areas like visual AI, natural language processing, um, in the ability to create integrated cloud services that can be sold as verticals to other financial institutions, we're finding that that concept has very broad applicability. So for example, in the smart city space, so um, uh, smart cities is one of our um, ecosystems, one of our five ecosystems that we're focused on. In addition to pr providing, let's say in Shenzhen, we provide a single app that allows every citizen in Shenzhen to access pretty much every government service uh, with the same ease of use as you can access an online service. And if you think of most government internet services, they're usually internet 1.0 or typically internet minus 1.0. Uh, so this is that, something that you developed? So we've, we've developed that in conjunction with the Shenzhen government. But what we're finding is that a lot of our analytics, our AI, um, our, our blockchain solutions uh, can be used for government record keeping, for property registers, for uh, traffic management, for pollution management. Uh, there's a whole raft of services that build off of capabilities that Ping An has been able to build over the last five or six years using advanced technology, but integrating that and finding applications for that technology and then providing it as an integrated cloud-based service. So we're finding that concept is very scalable horizontally into quite a wide range of areas. I would position us as a financial institution uh, that has embraced technology deeply and is now pursuing um, uh, a broad range of opportunities in five ecosystems, finance, health, auto, home, and smart cities that leverage those capabilities uh, and that create new, um, new logics for um, customers uh, in, uh, what's, what's around the, each of those business areas. When you look at something, you, when you look at an opportunity, uh, what are you looking for, what thrills you, you know, and, and where do you find the connections? In the role I have with the fund, I'm constantly looking at new businesses. And I mean, the first thing that I, I try to do is cut through the hype. 
you know, there's a lot of hype around. Yeah. Everyone's an AI company. Yeah. Everyone's a blockchain yeah. company. Everyone has a ridiculous valuation that you can't reconcile okay. with any cash flow for. So a very healthy skepticism is the first yeah. thing, Excellent. right? Yeah. Number one. Yeah. Uh, number two is, you know, are there real capabilities, real technologies? Uh, is there a uniqueness to the business model? So Num real? Number three is, is the customer uh, really getting something of value? Is there a problem being solved and is there a value proposition so what, 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 and is it creating loyalty? What have you seen that's real recently? Um, you know, uh, how do you cut through the draws? We're, we're still at a relatively early stage in building our portfolio. Um, one of our first investments was a company called 10X Future Technologies in the B2B space for banks. Uh, set up by Anthony Jenkins, uh, the former CEO of Barclays in London. Mm. And uh, so 10X's mission is to essentially replace the legacy stack of a bank with a cloud-based, modular, API-linked uh, solution such that any individual technology is never so large that it can't be swapped out you know, relatively easily with a new component when a new technology comes along. It is, the data is all centralized. It is tiered based on the, the level of structure you need for that data, whether it's ledger data or whether it is data that could be um, uh, uh, Lovely. So uh, the, used for big data purposes. Core banking as we know it. Basically, and uh, they're doing really well. So um, uh, they've got, uh, they started out with Virgin Money in the UK, right. um, who unfortunately got taken over by Clyde's, Clydesdale Yorkshire Bank. Right. So that contract stopped, although it was after um, uh, Virgin had paid 10x to actually build the platform, uh, quite a large amount of money. Uh, since that time, they've uh, uh, acquired uh, uh, um, nationwide Building Society is a core client, right. um, a top three global bank. Um, they've just got an Australian bank that's uh, um, in the process of signing up with them and another top three global bank. So they're really on the road to scaling and to success. Right. And for me, this is a good example where you've got a very unique proposition. Uh, we've scoured the landscape and there really isn't anybody at the enterprise grade that does yes. what they do. Yes. Um, none of the legacy vendors want to do this yes. because they're all conflicted. But the funny thing about the legacy vendors is that they're conflicted, they're, they're protecting their legacy. At the same time, they are doing this. They are investing in um, you know, in apps, in the application layer, right? So they've, been, they, they, they've gone out to invest in startups themselves. Well, they have, usually on top of their legacy platform, uh, as opposed to as so a substitute. A, yeah. And every bank faces this challenge. So I, I think this, this thing has, you know, massive runway. There are probably 3,000 banks in the world that need this solution. Um, and every bank has a replica of the same problem. So how much of that is, is Pingan Bank or Pingan itself? How much of Pingan the bank or ping on the financial group legacy and how much of it is cloud? So all, so 100% of our business is cloud now. Uh, so over five years between 2000 uh, and, and 12 and 2017, Ping An basically built its own private cloud. So all of our 500 million users sit on that cloud. Every application from every business has either been ported, rewritten or purchased uh, to basically function on a commodity platform. Every single piece of technology we build is fungible across every operating unit within the company um, and the commodity processing platform that the company has created is fundamental to that. So that is unique in the world. There is no other financial institution anywhere close to our scale that has done that and is a huge enabler for Ping An. So where Ping An is, is extremely consistent with the vision that Anthony has for 10X, as an example. Since I was just happened to be in Beijing um, in the health space, uh, there's a company called AirDoc. Okay. And what they do is they take a, a scan of your retina. Uh, and from that, applying an AI algorithm, they can determine 30 disease types in literally a second. No and give you a comprehensive report arteriosclerosis, diabetic retinopathy, um, high blood pressure, uh, all kinds of things that you would never expect to know about yourself that you can tell because the eye is one of the, f is the only place in the body where you can actually look through blood vessels and veins. Um, and uh, so this is a very sophisticated piece of uh, technology. Uh, they're doing very well in starting to scale that business. So what's interesting here is that you're, you're going into areas in medicine which you wouldn't have if you didn't take that platform view of, um, of the, the dog thing that you're doing, like the... Uh... Well, I think health is a huge opportunity for us. Right. So finding um, ways of delivering health services, diagnostics and treatment right. on a decentralized basis, leveraging mobile devices uh, is a fundamental strategy for us. 
and you know, we think that's going to be the future. We think that health can be as big as finance as a, as a revenue pool and an opportunity over time. How did that opportunity come to you? Like, is it because of the good doctor uh, uh, well, focus that you have? Because of our health ecosystem focus, which is good doctor, there's a company called Health Connect that provides analytic and data services to the state health insurance system at a municipal level in China. Uh, we have a, a, a clinic enterprise platform, of course, we're the largest health insurance provider already. Um, interestingly, in partnership with Discovery Life from South Africa, who owns 25% of our health business, which is a very interesting choice of partner. It's a very sophisticated, as you know, very analytically driven company um, uh, based in South Africa. So the fact that Ping An chose them as their partner as opposed to a more conventional choice seven, eight years ago, back in 2012 when that business was started, is quite significant in itself. But anyway, health is a very big area of commitment for Ping An. Uh, we have uh, long-term ambitions in that space. We think we can bring a lot of value uh, to the health infrastructure of China. So. China has huge challenges in meeting the demands of its aging population, the onset of chronic diseases, the incidence of diseases like lung cancer, where 54% of males still smoke in China, and you know, 9% of long-term smokers will get lung cancer. That's what the data says. Um, so uh, there are enormous needs, and there is no question that the health system today is undercapacitized and under specced to meet that challenge, and right. that's fully, fully acknowledged by the government. So, uh -huh. Given that Good Doctor gives you so much data and it's linked yes. to the insurance business that you have, mm. how much linkages have you found so far? And well, I think, first of all, you've got to be very careful um, about what you do with data. And if someone gives us health data about themselves in the context of um, uh, telemedicine else. treatment, Which you know, we, we absolutely can't use that data for underwriting, for example, okay. or in a way that could be in any way adverse to customers. So we have to be extremely uh, disciplined and careful in segregating data uh, when it is given in one context and cannot and may not be used in another. Many of the legal boundaries within our group, say for example the bank, um, data protection laws for bank customers are extremely strict in China. Actually, China itself is heading very much down to the path of, down the path of GDPR and the OECD guidelines on, so on privacy. It's a, clock, it's a clock ticking on you then. Um, you know, that, that a lot of the freedom that you had so far, it's going to be slowing down a lot. Even in Europe, once you have customer consent, um, and as long as you make it clear to customers what you're going to do with data, you are not restricted from using data in, uh, you know, across across boundaries. I think all of the big companies in China, like us, and like presumably the tech giants, are solving for a um, uh, a different set of standards uh, and making ourselves future compatible. We don't see that as a huge limitation. Uh, we find actually that our proprietary data is always the most valuable because that's the data that no one else has. That's the data that's unique and tells us something very specific about a customer. In the old days when you work in a bank, proprietary data means the GL, the, the general ledger. That's you know what the, what the customer has with you right. historically. And then proprietary data is what the customer does with you, which is current, but it's still you know within and, and then everyone talked about uh, big data, you know, and, and, you know, tagging it and stuff like that. But here you're talking about something else. Uh. So, for example, when you call our call center, so we have an integrated call center for every business, um, and uh, what we do is we record every conversation. Of course, we tell people we're recording the conversations. We turn all voice to text. That then becomes machine analyzable. Uh, we use that to train our voice robots. So where we're basically building uh, conversational AI engines that can deal with certain topics uh, comprehensively with customers, all of that is coming from our conversation data from real customers. It's all being abstracted. We're, we're building uh, algorithms that effectively allow the computer to understand what you're saying and respond in an appropriate way. Uh, that's all proprietary data. In our auto finance business, uh, sorry, auto insurance business, uh, we have a, the world's largest telematics uh, platform. And uh, what we do is use your mobile phone. Uh, you can join a service called Ping An Good Driver. And it turns out that the accelerometer, the gyroscope, the GPS in your phone allow us to know where you are at any point in time. We know if you're accelerating, 
if you're using, if you're braking too hard, we know if you're on hard roads, dirt roads, we know if you're in busy areas, in accident prone areas, we know if you like to drive when it's raining, when it's icy, um, we can drive an enormous amount of information from that and that allows us to um, think about risk in a completely different way. That's all data that we could only get by having this program ourselves. But have you started monetizing it? Like, um, we, yeah. you know, like uh, product, productization, examples of that? Uh, China, uh, the regulatory environment creates both opportunities and constraints. So in many of the markets, in the many of the provinces, uh, we're, we're uh, locked into fixed pricing. Uh, but we can offer uh, loyalty incentive benefits for customers um, who demonstrate superior risk characteristics, as an example. Uh, and we are able to, um, another example I would give is um, auto claims. So if you have a, a dent in your car, you can scan the damage. Uh, we can instantly assess the damage using, basically we have a database of every single external panel, every single external part. We have uh, 23 damage scenarios as to what could be wrong with that. The computer can assess, does this need to be repaired or replaced? What will it cost? Parts and labor, that varies by where you are in the country. We can give you an instant quote. And if you agree, we can give you an instant settlement. So, so there is the institution with its proprietary uh, data sets and so on. And then there is the data feed that's been given to you by the customer and so on. And, yep. and then there's the, the things that you are going out to look for and to add in to, to the whole story. Give me a, 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 a bit better sense of the partnerships that you have for what the group already does, the APIs, the, you know, the, 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 the existing ecosystem outside of the acquisitions that you're going out to look for. Um, one of the really interesting things Ping An has done is build a platform to support our life insurance agents. So we still believe that there's you know, a, a role left for um, the human element in selling life insurance. It's a consultative process. It's quite an emotional process. Most people are underinsured. Most people don't recognize the, the need for uh, risk protection. And the human role is vitally important in our view. So what we've done is we've, we've kept our agents. We actually have 1.4 million of them now. And what we've done is built a, bit, a digital infrastructure that supports pretty much everything they do, all the way from recruitment to the way in which they manage their prospect database and their clients using WeChat and using these content engines where we can give customers... Who the content engines? We do. Okay. We do. But, but what, about, what about your agents or, or, or third parties who want to build you know, APIs um, around you? Uh, well, agents are um, able to build their own content, of course. Uh, but in, what we're trying to do is, in this particular example, I'll come to the second part of your question separately, but in this particular case, what we're trying to do is automate everything in the agent's okay. life okay. so they can just spend their time connecting with customers and, and making connections that actually create value for the customer and, of course, for the company. Okay. And so everything from recruitment to CRM management to client communication, even when you ask a question as a customer, the first answers you get are going to be automated answers, machine-generated answers. And it's when you look like you're really interested in something, that's when the agent will interact with you. Um, so that's quite powerful. And of course, the whole order entry system. Um, in terms of external linkages, there are many, many linkages. So it, payments would be the clearest example. You can't exist in China without being linked to the online payment networks. We have our own, we have the number three payment wallet. Uh, but um, you know, it's, it's a long way behind um, Alipay and Tenpay. So of, of course we have to interact with, with, uh, with those players. Right. Um, of course, um, platforms like WeChat offer a lot of widgets that allow clients to access many Ping An services. Of course we participate in that. Um, of course we want to be embedded in e-commerce wherever it's possible to be, uh, okay. both through our payment products and our financing products. So um, there are many, many places where we're, we're linked into you know, a much broader ecosystem of e-commerce and uh, okay. of, of that, e-finance. Are there those who look at you and say, oh, you should be part of their ecosystem? Oh, okay. We've got this business called OneConnect, and the original purpose of OneConnect was to take um, uh, small banks in China, there's, there's a, under the big five or six banks, there's a raft of hundreds and hundreds of medium-sized banks. There could be $10 billion to $150 billion in asset size. So they're not necessarily tiny at all. They're quite substantial. Mm -hmm. And these guys typically don't have um, substantial in-house technology capabilities. So we started by saying, well, could we offer 
let's say, mobile services for consumers and SMEs for these banks? The answer was yes. They'd love to have. They, they know they can't compete with Ali and Tencent. Can Ping An provide them with a competitive capability? Can it be cloud-based? Can it be always updated and always current? Yes, we can do that. We then found that our credit scores um, that we'd built for our virtual consumer lending business with the largest non-bank non uh, lender in China, and that business is completely virtual. We never take a piece of paper from a customer. Everything is online. Uh, the credit score we built for that turned, into, turned out to be something that was highly desirable for all these other banks. And when we could layer their customers into that, it increased the pool of clients that we were analyzing and allowed us to actually improve the quality of the score. Um, so we now have a database of about 800 million uh, customers, uh, and it serves well over 200 banks, including HSBC and Standard Chartered in China. Uh, and so that's become a whole business all by itself. Um, and it, you know, it, it comes from one of our businesses. Right. So it's so what, and so there's, there's a vast range of these services now. Fraud scores, mm -hmm. um, a lot of our AI services, facial recognition, voice print recognition, conversational AI services. So what's what's effectively happening is. You can be a small bank in China, and now we've actually built an office in Singapore, and we're offering this in Southeast Asia and selectively elsewhere in the world. You can now access this full range of Ping An services as a financial institution, even if you have very limited in-house technology capabilities. So I think that would be one example of us, very you know, in a very um, focused way, providing access to our ecosystem of capabilities. Uh, to institutions that yeah. don't have those. Is there an alternative to that or is there a variation of that? Uh, I'm really thinking APIs where um, the your ordinary customer, your ordinary partner likes you so much that you, they want you to be uh, a part of their ecosystem. The e-commerce example is a really good one where uh, in Crete, what's happened really is finance has been embedded into e-commerce. So we, we have many, many online merchants where um, you know, our services can easily be accessed. Um, I, are you asking, is there some fundamental platform business that's essentially an open architecture business uh, where people can, uh, you know, build their own capabilities? Um, I, th I think uh, Lufax is a good example of that. Um, and, you know, it's a completely open architecture wealth platform. Wherever possible, of course, if the wealth providers, the product providers are automated, of course we want to have API linkages to those, those people. Um, we, of course, want to control what's on that platform. We don't want anything on that platform. And on the customer side, um, of course, we are um, trying to scale that as much as possible. But, if, you know, we're bound also by KYC and other regulations that require us to control um, who it is that we offer and what it is we offer to them uh, through suitability requirements and so forth. So it would be wrong to, to imply that we've completely departed from the um, you know, financial institution sort of ethos and uh, to some extent set of constraints. Okay, payments is a, is, a, is a huge generator of content in itself. What have you been learning from Ping An Payments, for example? That, you know, it's a little under the radar, but well, yeah. you know, uh, how's that going and, you know, and, and how, how are you going to be scaling that? Um, it's a good business. Uh, it's obviously, it doesn't have anything like the market position of the, the two leaders in the space. Um, but you know, we are able to generate a lot of payment volume uh, from our own uh, proprietary ecosystem, from our customers, intra-group and with our partners. So uh, that's essentially what the business does. Uh, and um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a contributor to the group, it's profitable. Uh, but you know, it's nowhere near the scale of the, of, the, of the leaders in the marketplace. How would you classify what your own ecosystem looks like? And then when you got to see a 10x, for example, in, in the European uh, space, yes. um, and when you look out for any opportunities in the American space, yes. um, how would you describe those ecosystems and how are they different from yours? Yeah, so I think what's really interesting to me, and it probably comes back to your question about what's um, fundamentally different about Ping An, um, I think most Western financial institutions are in a kind of optimization mode. Most are in sort of cost containment mode. Uh, I, it's one of the interesting questions is how many new businesses have been created by developed market financial institutions in the last 15 years? Mm. How many? Mm. Uh, I can think of just a couple. I mean, Marcus by Goldman would be one example. Uh, I, actually, I can barely think of it. There are a few, but very, very few. They're mostly at very small scale. And in some ways, uh, the developed market financial sector has stopped creating new enterprises. 
And it just makes Ping An all the more distinctive where they can create repeatedly multi-billion dollar businesses uh, you know, as a, as a byproduct of their capabilities well, and of their market position. When you look at TEDx, were you looking at them as a supplier as much as a, as a partner for scaling? Both, yeah. Uh, so uh, we're certainly, now that their platform is mature, we're certainly looking at opportunities where, where that could be useful for Ping An and for Ping An Bank um, and for our OneConnect customers. Uh, and uh, in particular, our, our uh, OneConnect customers internationally. As a traditional retail banker, you think enterprise. You think institution, you think end-to-end, -end, uh, you think risk. Uh, yeah. Your risk is uh, within the institution, within the layers of um, you know, assets that you carry and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you think today? Like, um, you know, in, in, when you think of your, well, you're, you're thinking portfolio, you're talking, thinking um, you know, you're thinking investment today, but but um, in terms of financial services, yeah. um, if you actually ran a, a financial institution, I wouldn't call it a bank anymore. I would call it a um, a financial institution that is totally Im embedded into the lifestyle of its customers or something like that, right? Yeah. I mean, I think the form in which financial services can take is just fundamentally different. And a lot of the sort of boundaries that defined financial institutions traditionally are pretty artificial or a lot are a product of either regulation or um, physical constraints in distribution uh, or technology from the past. Um, and there's the opportunity to reshape financial services into pretty much anything you want it to be. One of the very important points is that the underlying nature of the financial service doesn't change. The way in which you shape it and deliver it, the context that you put it into, does change, um, and therefore the you know many of the fundamental considerations about risk, around yeah. liquidity, so me, around me... privacy, data protection, they're all exactly the same issues. They just take on a different form. Very important question: Will the products eventually change? Will what you sell actually change? Well, I hope that where we get to is far fewer, far more simpler. Uh, and far more flexible product platforms as opposed to the products that we think of uh, in financial services today. Um, so can I give an example? Um, I've always had this idea that you know, for every customer, if, if I know you as a customer, I should be able to tell you at any point what the entire universe of credit I can offer you is, secured and unsecured. You should know that. You shouldn't have to even ask me. And I think you know, we're getting to a point where some kind of value proposition like that becomes extremely possible, where I can already anticipate what your wealth management needs are, not just now, but pretty much for your whole life. And I can lay that out for you in a powerful way and show you what your options are and show you the most cost-effective and the, uh, the highest risk-adjusted risk return path that you should be following. I think these possibilities are very real now. So I think there are um, quantum shifts in the kind of services that we can offer. Um, we've yet to see those, or at least we're only seeing parts of them today. What are you personally expecting from 5G? Um, you know, what, what are you looking forward to? How much of a game changer will it be and what sort of place do you think will come from it that, that is worth waiting for? Yeah. Well, I think uh, it's quite interesting. I think the, the um, examples that are in the public domain are pretty limited, actually. And I think many people struggle to imagine what happens when you increase upload and download speed by 100 times or even 1,000 times, which may be possible. Um, I think where we get to is this world where pretty much anything you can imagine in the physical world is either going to be virtualized or it's going to have a digital twin. And there are going to be sensors for pretty much everything. You know, a car already has, when you buy it, the average car already has 1,200 sensors embedded in it. And typically, the auto, uh, the OEMs today, typically suck out for the first two years when they pay for the SIM card in the car, because almost all cars get sold with an embedded SIM card, and the subscription is paid for by the OEM for the first two years. They typically only take about 30 data elements, 26 to 30 data elements. So there's this massive pool of data that tells you not just about the car, but how that car is being used, how it's being driven. <clears throat> it tells you all kinds of things about uh, the, the lifestyle of the individuals that own those cars or drive those cars. 
um, that data has to be massively valuable. 5G allows us not to be constrained to 30 data elements. It allows us very easily to suck all of that data out. And it exponentially multiplies the amount of information. Who's, who's, that we who's have. a leader now? I mean, who's, who are you looking at who you think um, would be a game changer? I think, I think in that space, um, all of the um, OEMs are interested in this. None of them has particularly strong capabilities today. There are a couple of companies that are leaders in helping them aggregate data and make use of it. One is a UK company called Wajo. Um, another one is an Israeli company called Autonomo. They're probably the two market leaders today. Right. But I think that's a good example of you know, a domain where the sensor layer already exists, uh, where it's, it's probably not that difficult to imagine use cases for predictive maintenance, uh, for usage-based insurance, uh, for um, uh, driver risk assessment, uh, for even uh, things that you might think of as peripheral. Uh, if you're a mapping company and you want to know where is it raining right now, guess what? The windscreen sensor tells you whether it's raining right now, mm. tells you how much it's raining. Mm. Uh, that data is all there. Uh, typically, companies like uh, Waze uh, will use background feeds from mobile mm -hmm. uh, in order to populate the roads yeah. uh, with where cars are. Increasingly, providers, telecom providers, application providers, and handset providers are blocking those passive flows. So connected car data gives you very reliable data as to exactly where cars are on the road. And again, from using even a sample of cars, you can extrapolate and get very, very accurate information. So I think that's one example of a use case. There are many others. Um, think of a factory, complex set of equipment from different vendors. Some of those pieces of equipment, the newer ones, will already have very sophisticated sensor technology and optimization technology, but there is nothing that integrates the whole line. Well, if you can create a digital twin of everything um, and you can apply you know, a, a sensor layer, a digital representation layer, and an optimization layer, you can start managing the productivity of that asset in a very different way. Mm. You can structure the ownership of that asset in a very different yeah. way. Someone else can own the asset. Yeah. You can just pay by widget that you produce. Yeah. Um, that someone else actually knows as much about your business, maybe right. more than you do. Yeah. So in your, in your fund, how far outside your remit will you go or will you be willing to go to look for investments that you know that, that may not have any immediate um, you know correlation to yeah so well so for example in in the case of connected cars very interesting to us we're the biggest auto insurer in China the biggest auto financier and we own the biggest auto sales natural. platform so that's that's a natural area for us to focus on so we're interested in platforms that sell cars we're interested in connected car data we're interested in usage based insurance they're all pretty core to us um, manufacturing IoT, we're very interested in this space. Um, this is not a business that we are in directly right now. Um, it's highly relevant to our commercial insurance business. It's highly relevant to our leasing business, highly relevant to our bank business. Uh, so we think that um, there's certainly opportunities there. Uh, we haven't found one that we um, uh, have been able to um, get comfortable investing just yet, but there are a couple that we're looking at that we're quite interested in. Um, and this is a space that we're interested in. We want a spectrum between things like, let's take AirDoc. AirDoc is already working with our businesses um, to you know, provide screening for our customers, for example. So their, their platform was ready to go and we could plug it in very fast. Um, we want some of those. We also want things that are maybe five years out there, uh, maybe things that we will never activate, but pre present option value for the future. And we want a spectrum in between. I don't think being too weighted towards the short term is going to be helpful mm. uh, for this type of fund, or being too weighted to you know, blue sky opportunities is going to be helpful. We, we really want to have a balanced spectrum. But are they all acquisition centric or are they? Uh, we're typically, so we're, our minimum ticket's about $10 million. Mm. Uh, we're typically investing um, 15 to 30. So far, our largest investment is about 45 US, mm. um, which is a company called Finleap in Germany, which is the largest um, company builder in the fintech space in Europe. Mm. Uh, it's a very interesting company. Um, we are typically looking for 10 to 20% of the company. We absolutely do not want control. Uh, we're looking for the ability to create equity ownership as a, as a way of creating alignment. 
Um, and then we typically want to create some kind of cooperation. And that could range from a licensing agreement, a JV, uh, you know, through to actually creating a new business together in China. So you want to see those, both of them, alignment and cooperation at the onset. So then that, that's it. You, then you start the whole process. That's and, right, yes. uh, Okay. Well, it looks like it's going to be a, it's, it's, it's a wonderful, uh, you know, put your seat belts on journey. So It is. It's a unique company. Yes. Uh, I don't think there's anything like it in China or in the world. And for me, the ability to be this kind of point of intersection Absolutely. between this unique and diverse Chinese company, super innovative, and this entire world of external innovation, I don't think there's anything like it. And the fact that you're, you're looking at partnerships uh, completely agnostic, whether the European, African, uh, Asian and so on. In fact, uh, you've missed out Southeast Asia, so no, what, what are you doing in that? So I think the general story is that most of the fundamental innovations are still coming from developed markets, US, continental Europe, um, UK, Israel, to some extent uh, Australasia. In emerging markets, for the most part, and I'm generalizing because there are always exceptions, for the most part what you're seeing is adaptations of models that have been proven elsewhere and the company is focused on the challenges of deploying that model in a totally different context. So if you take e-commerce and you try and put it into Indonesia or India, which has now been successfully done multiple times, obviously it's a totally different challenge from building out Amazon in the first place. Uh, so uh, you can understand why those priorities are as they are. So in general, that's what we see. Uh, there are examples of businesses in um, uh, consumer-focused businesses in Southeast Asia that we certainly are interested in and we are, in, we are talking to. What we're interested in particular is our ability to bring value to those businesses using Ping An Technologies. Jonathan, this is a continuing conversation and we hope to be able to talk to you again soon. Emmanuel, thank you very much. Cheers.